Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for our webinar. The topic of today's webinar is uh, digital and data technology in measurement, evaluation and learning. And it looks like we've got quite a few of you today, um, 20 to begin with. I imagine there'll be more joining us as we continue. I'd like to start, as I always do, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands that you're all joining us from, wherever in the world that may be, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. In my case, um, I'm joining you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I'd like to acknowledge that in Australia, sovereignty was never ceded, and we're living on what is and always will be the lands of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. For those of you who haven't met me before, my name's Cam and I'm the head of the Academy at Clear Horizon. And uh, Clear Horizon's Asia Pacific's largest evaluation and design consultancy. We're based here in Melbourne and we support change makers with co-design and evaluation solutions for people, place and planet. And our Academy is all about taking the knowledge of our consultants and translating it into great learning opportunities uh, for you all to dive in and uh, get across what we do in day in, day out. We deliver courses in a range of topics. Our biggest flagship course is measurement, evaluation and learning. We also do courses on theory of change, most significant change, developmental evaluation, which is a course we're building at the moment. We'll be launching in August, which is really exciting, as well as a course uh, adjacent to the topic of this webinar, which is all about data visualization and reporting. And there'll be more to come about that course as we move through. So for those of you who haven't attended a webinar with us before, um, essentially, we're gonna kick off by introducing you to the panelists, which you'll see up the top of your screen. Um, I'll throw out a few questions, kind of pre-cooked questions to them to begin with, uh, and then we'll jump into some questions that we've received through the registration forms. And then we'll open up to questions from uh, our attendees. And if you have a question as things move through, there's a Q&A box down the bottom of your screen. If you click on that now, you can see that there's the opportunity to type a question in there. You can also um, upvote a question. And what we'll do is we'll go with the most upvoted questions first and make our way through the list. Depending on how much time we have, we may get through all of them and we may not. Um, also, if you wanna have a chat with our panelists uh, or each other, there's the chat function across on the right, which you should all be familiar with from Zoom, just normal as you would normally chat. Um, and we'll be checking that through the thing. And if there's anything to raise uh, with a panelist, I'll, I'll flag it. But if you do have any you know, bigger questions, please drop them into the Q&A. Um, the webinar is pitched at an introductory level. So we'll try to shoot our, um, our conversation at that level. Um, it's not gonna veer into really advanced topics at this stage. If you would like to take a deeper dive, as I mentioned before, we have a six week course that goes into much more detail. We still think it's an, a fairly introductory course. There's so much more that can be done in this space. Um, but yeah, this is really just kind of wetting your whistle to, to get started with data visualization. So it's really now my uh, absolute pleasure to introduce our panelists for today. Joining me, we have Laura Martin, Jen Riley, uh, Adriana Mendieta, and Drew de Oliveira. And uh, very excited to have them all joining us today. I'll kick off by introducing Laura. Uh, Laura is the Senior Manager of Health Intelligence at Western Victoria Primary Health Network. Her role, role is all about connecting ideas, plans, people, as well as data together to improve health system delivery in the region. And Laura is super passionate about improvement and innovation. So like I'm sure many of our members of the audience, her favorite question is why? Um, Laura is also an alumni of our Data Analysis and Visualization for Impact course. So great to have you joining us, Laura. Really excited. Um, and yeah, we'll, uh, we'll dive into a question with you in a moment, but first I'll introduce the other panelists. Jen is our Chief Digital and Data Officer. She's a self-confessed tech and impact measurement geek. Um, and on our recent staff retreat, she was identified as the Yoda of our digital and data team. So great to have you back with us for another webinar, Jen. Adriana uh, is our consultant, a consultant, sorry, in our digital team. And she also designed uh, the course uh, on data visualization and reporting. Um, and yeah, she'll be joining us in the course as, the, as our lead mentor when it kicks off later this month. Welcome again, Adriana. So great to have you back. 
And last but definitely not least, uh, Drew is our Senior Digital and Data Consultant, and uh, he had the uh, great title of uh, Han Solo of the digital team at the retreat. I'd love to hear the story behind that. Thanks so much uh, for joining us, Drew. Uh, so now we're going to jump into our first question, and this one's for Jen. How are digital and data technology transforming the measurement, evaluation, and learning landscape? And maybe give us a bit of an overview there. Thanks, Cam. Hello, everyone. Thanks for spending your lunchtime with us, or early morning, or wherever you are in the world. Um, I think I've got a few slides I want to pop up in answer to this. So uh, magically, things appear. Um, so I think. Looking at the problem, this is what digital people sort of do is, you know, what is the situation for our for our users and I think, you know, the challenge is with monitoring and evaluation frameworks is that they are often developed and not always taken up as much as they could be. And um, I think we can all point to having a uh, you know, a framework developed and, you know, it's sitting there and, and maybe, maybe collecting a bit of dust. So, and why is this? And, and I think one of the big reasons behind this is actually that, you know, they are complex and they are big and they're in Word documents. They're not particularly user friendly. They're hard to get hold of. There's lots of reports written in there and lots of indicators. And, you know, they're kind of these, you know, static 2D you know, documents. And, and in order to bring them to life, um, I think digital offers an amazing opportunity. So I'm going to get us to go on to the, the next slide there, Lee. So why does this need to change? And I, I've said, I've sort of written up there that, you know, evaluators, you know, need, need to stop crying about their work not being used. But I think there's another reason why we need to digitalize our male work and I think you know 75% of the workforce in the next couple of years will be digital natives this is a whole generation that is used to working in a seamless online environment where you know they've got instant food through uber instant tv through netflix they can have a personalized experience when they sign on to airbnb that remembers that they like the beach side and they like you know somewhere near a coffee shop you know, we've got all these new platforms that um, uh, have changed our lives. And there is an expectation around this sort of instant, connected, seamless experience. And, and I really believe that Mel is ripe for disruption. And, and we've certainly started on that journey at Clear Horizon about uh, bringing in digital co data collection tools, uh, reporting tools using Power BI, and now we're starting to look at uh, how we build male frameworks in an online, online environment. I also think there's, the, you know, it can improve efficiencies and effectiveness um, and, and reduce errors. And some of the collection tools that we've put in place have, you know, reduced things like lost data, uh, losing the tool itself, uh, you know, people move on and you lose the knowledge. So having some way of a one-stop shop or an end-to-end -end online user experience will mean that hopefully we can automate a lot of that work, increase our efficiencies, but also better security, better privacy for the data as well. And, it, and you know, we're at the beginning of this digitalization in our sector. And I think um, it will open up more opportunities to, 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 to leverage off this digital world of cloud technologies, the internet of things, big data, you know, there are so many, so many opportunities out there. And I do think if we don't evolve, um, somebody else will, will do it, you know, you know, I think, you know, Kodak and, um, and Blockbuster uh, pretty much wish they'd gotten on that digitalization journey quicker. So in terms of what does it mean for us here at Clear Horizon, I think, you know, for us, it's about this sort of connection of the parts, you know, uh, connecting, you know, the outcomes and indicators with the data outcome reports. Um, it's, it's about making sure people can, users of mail can find what they need quickly and sort of looking at a front end and back end of mail, um, you know, much as you would with any online platform that it's about making sure that people in that system have access to what they need, automating what we can. Um, and as I said, that sort of front end, back end, the back end having a really organized data warehouse so that uh, information can be used quickly. 
So we, we for, to make this real, what we're doing is we're putting um, frameworks and reports into an online space. So we're putting it into a HTML, uh, CSS, using React, using a JavaScript framework, so that people can input into a form for their framework and then um, have a series of apps that can connect on. And I think the, the, there are many, many technologies out there. And I think that's going to be a decision for many monitoring evaluation experts is which data, which digital tool do we go with? Um, and, and how does it all modularize and fit together and talk together? So I think that's, that's some really interesting trends uh, to consider. I think I've got one more slide there where I've just sort of said, well, you know, what else does it mean for us? And I think it is things such as ensuring your cloud technology is for us in Australia is hosted in Australia due to privacy law, um, using progressive web applications so they can be used across uh, Apple and Android devices. Um, you know, having a digital team in house or at least digital partners to work with. And for us, that's meant in just the last 12 months, recruiting, you know, a business analyst, a full stack developer, having Power BI developers on our team, which we've had for a couple of years now, and also adopting a digital mindset around agile project management, you know, that we have to work in sprints and, and, and in human centered design and selecting a stack as well and deciding which technology and languages to use. So it's a huge amount of change that we're going through. That's great, Jen. Thanks so much for providing that big picture overview. I know we've got some questions uh, from our attendees about some more about the, those technologies that we use. So we'll jump into those a bit later. Uh, Laura, I understand um, with your role, you're a early adopter, a bit of a leader um, with digital and data technology and measurement, evaluation and learning. Wondering if you could tell a bit uh, about how your organization is working in this area. Certainly, thanks, Cam. Um, so as Cam mentioned, I'm with Western Victoria Primary Health Network. We're a not-for-profit um, that has basically been contracted by the Commonwealth um, to um, do a comprehensive needs assessment, health needs assessment for our region and um, to then commission into those gaps. Um, so um, you know, we have 75,000 square kilometers, 600,000 people who live in this area. Um, how do you um, bring together all of the data and all of the thinking um, ab about the needs of the people living in this community and what affects their health and well being and um, make informed decisions? Well, you do it with data, you do it with data analysis, you know, you do it by um, turning all of those um, pieces of qualitative and quantitative um, information into something useful. Um, and that's um, been the charge of my team. So I have um, our health intelligence and population health team. They work together um, in creating the needs assessment, undertaking the analysis of all of that qualitative and quantitative data, and then hopefully um, putting that out to the rest of the organization to help inform um, some of the decisions that are being made across the organization. Um, in the early days, um, our teams only existed for 18 months. So in the early days, we were really just scrambling um, to gather all the data together, um, you know, try to create some kind of thinking um, that um, was associated with um, data that was collected in probably, you know, 15 different formats, um, not always in the same way. How do you bring that together? How do you go through it, think about it, and then provide some useful um, insights to programs? And then a little bit of um, program reporting was happening in the um, first stages. You know, if you commission an activity, then, um, you know, you want to kind of follow up on um, what kind of outputs and acti what activity levels are being delivered. Um, however, one of the first things I um, brought to the team was um, we need to move from that um, monitoring of outputs 
to monitoring outcomes. And anyone who um, tries to monitor health outcomes um, knows it's very complex. Um, it can take years before you actually have evidence. Um, so thinking about, um, again, the data that we need, the things that we need to be looking at, and how we can impact some of the decisions made inside of the organization about the services that we will commission um, became about providing that insight. Um, from the data or um, as our team call it, um, the gold nuggets. Um, so those things that really are gonna matter and really make a difference. Um, so we've been um, evolving to the point in the last 18 months where um, we're really starting to help inform um, strategy of the organization, um, decisions about where funding goes, how much funding um, is associated with a variety of um, models of care and um, really been um, thinking about how our internal stakeholders, who are the decision makers, um, want to consume the data. Um, it, you know, what works for them? Um, what way do they best understand the data? Because even though some of us can look at, you know, massive, huge um, spreadsheets and dig into those, you know, why is this happening? And, you know, work through that process. Um, most of the people in our organization don't consume data that way. So we've had to start being clever and thinking about um, how we can um, provide this information in a digital format or in a visualized and digital format. Um, which has become even more important for us in the last um, 12, 18 months, because um, Western Victoria is clearly part of, you know, Victoria. We've um, spent a fair bit of time in lockdown, and that's actually changed um, our model from having four um, brick and mortar businesses or offices spread out through the region to a, a work from anywhere model. Um, which means we also need to be able to have all of this data, all of these visualizations, all the reporting, all of the mechanisms um, in a, a digital world um, so that whoever the decision maker is in whichever part of the region, they've got um, that data in a format they can use at their fingertips. Fantastic, Laura. That's yeah. That's really great to understand. Um, yeah, what you've been doing over the last twelve months um, in terms of pulling the data together, transforming it into a way that makes sense to the, the people who need it to make in, informed strategy and, and decisions in general. Um, interested to hear from you, Adriana. What would you say your understanding of the people that come to our course? What are what are their needs um, around data visualization and reporting? Thanks, Cam. So what I've observed from uh, our learners participating in our Power BI course, one of the biggest challenges uh, that people face is definitely integrating data sources, uh, um, integrating multiple data sources and making them play nicely together. You know, getting the information exactly the way they need it and produce meaningful and amazing reports. Uh, uh, reports that communicate well to uh, everybody. But um, having multiple sources has not uh, been the only challenge that I've seen here. Definitely data sets are usually not clean and organized in an optimal way. Uh, so people can actually analyze them. But during the course, for example, we introduced learners to basic principles of data, uh, of optimal data setup. And that's when learners start identifying why it's been so difficult for them to analyze their data. You know, like they're having those wonderful aha moments during the course, like that's why. Um, thanks to the knowledge on the basic principles of data setup, our learners start thinking about how they collect their data, actually how they are creating their questions and surveys. So they end up getting analyzable data sets. Uh, one important thing that I would like to mention about our Power BI course is that we explain all the concepts and principles in lay people's words. Uh, we're thinking about our learners and social makers without a, num uh, without a numbers or data analytic background. And we start by learning about the basics of data filtering and aggregation, 
while using language and examples that are simple and easy to understand. We even use example data sets that social makers can relate to. You know, we, we don't use AdventureWorks data sets. I don't know if people have uh, heard about AdventureWorks, huge data sets that many people use. Um, so overall, by the end of our intro course, learners will be able to create dynamic Power BI reports, uh, but also will have a good understanding of best practices around visualizations, and will have the foundation, strong foundation for powering up those reports and understanding, actually understanding what is happening behind the scenes. Fantastic. Thanks, Adriana, for that overview. Uh, Drew, we'd love to hear a bit about how you've seen data intelligence help with your clients that you work with. Yeah, for sure. Um, thanks, Cam. I think uh, the biggest uh, change that I see in my clients is uh, something that Adriana touched on, which is uh, them becoming aware of these gaps in their data pipeline and their capabilities. However, once those gaps are addressed, uh, we often find that clients are able to get very sharp with harnessing uh, the right data to communicate the right message in the right format to the right audiences. And this often leads to uh, them being able to tell compelling stories with data, which serves as a very effective differentiator uh, when seeking funding and grants. Just being able to uh, communicate the impact that they're making using data is a very powerful message. Mm, fantastic. That goes back to something that um, Laura was saying there around, yeah, checking how the funding is being used and then it's you know delivering the impact that was intended. That's great. Thanks, Drew. Um, great. So uh, we touched a little bit there on um, the course and how it's helping uh, our clients. We'd, be, we'd love to hear from you, Laura. Um, a little bit about your experience of the course and maybe what it's led to in your work. Certainly, thank you. Uh, about, again, 18 months ago, our team was pulled together. Um, we weren't really sure where we were going or what we were going to be doing. Um, the team had been hired. Um, I was part of that whole process, um, so I didn't know what skills my team had. And um, I am... Um, not that technical, to be honest. I have a great title, but it's very, it can be very confusing. Um, I tend to be the person who actually tries to translate between technical and um, the users, um, which is how I scored the role. Um, but um, a lot of my team is a bit more technical. Um, what I wanted us to do was to um, actually figure out how we were going to approach um, this um, concept of moving to providing insights and how we were going to, uh, you know, make the data um, useful um, for those people who needed it. Um, we, um, we had a link um, with Clear Horizons through um, Jen, who was um, a colleague of our um, previous CEO. Um, so had a meeting with Jen and the team, decided we wanted to put a whole group, so my whole team through the um, Power BI course or the data visualization course and um, spoke to you, Cameron. It was right at the start of um, COVID um, and you, um, were good enough to switch your whole program online fairly quickly, which allowed my whole team to attend. And um, in doing that, um, my intent, because I did attend as well, um, was that we all have that same grounding and we all have that same foundational knowledge. Um, the advantage for me in attending the course with my staff was that um, now when I get requests, you know, from the executive team or um, one of the directors about, oh, we want this report. And, you know, there's that kind of thinking that I can just push a magic button or the team can push a magic button and there's this beautiful report. I now know, yeah, that's not how it works. There's a lot of time spent in cleaning data and organizing data so that you can use it. Um, so I can be a bit of a buffer uh, for my team and explain to exec, We'll work on that. Um, we'll, we, you know, we can get you a prototype. It's probably going to take about this much time, um, and then go back to the team, um, work on creating something. Um, I also have a pretty extensive health background, so I know the data that's out there. 
um, I um, can help inform the team about where we might go um, to get data that we may be missing um, to look at. But um, one of the really cool things my team has done since attending the course is they set up a community of practice among the um, nine um, others who attended together. And um, they um, have assigned each other little tasks. You create this report, you do that, um, so that they can um, continue to build on their learning and their um, knowledge um, so that they can challenge each other, um, so that they start building a, a uniform, I guess, language of communicating through the data. Um, for us, it's been a, um, a really great experience um, in that um, I've watched uh, people who had no experience at all with data cleansing or Power BI um, to be able to um, actually speak to our staff about collecting data in a certain format so that it becomes more useful. It's probably enough, Kim. That's fantastic, Laura. It really rings true, I think, that comment you made about being an intermediary or a buffer between the people who are building the tech and doing the analysis and the people who need the output of the, the information and reporting. I think Drew would probably definitely resonate with that. Um, that's great. Thanks, Laura. Um, now we're getting to the, the meaty part, probably the part that a lot of our audience members have been hanging out for. We want to um, demonstrate a few examples of how digital and data technology is being used in action. Um, so I might throw first to you, Jen, and show us a, a showcase of Windana. Great, thanks, uh, Cam. So Windana is a drug and alcohol service here in Melbourne, and I um, we we were brought in to help them visualise their results. They work at a client level, and that data can be aggregated at a program and at an organisational level. Um, so I'll take you through the use case. Uh, there's a first slide here about. Um, you know, starting with the users and Mary, you know, is, is, a, is, a, is a resident of the therapeutic community, um, which is 12 month resi. And every four weeks she's surveyed about how she's tracking against the program outcomes, the range of physical, mental uh, well-being, and program engagement outcomes, which makes up their theory of change. Um, we did that work first, of course. And then Mark is one of the workers of the therapeutic community, and he wants to work with Mary on her recovery journey um, and wants to see if those outcomes are changing. So we, we uh, put together a, a, a survey, which was made up of a series of um, therapeutic, or well, actually uh, sort of tools that are uh, evidence-based. So there was the mixture of the DAS-21. Um, there was also the... Um, assessment of recovery, which is one that's used in therapeutic communities, and, uh, and also the WHO qual, the quality of life through the World Health Organization, um, and also the uh, client assessment inventory. So there's a number and the Australian um, treatment outcomes profile. So there's a number of sort of tools put together in a survey, and then the results were shown instantly on a dashboard. So a client would fill out the survey, and I'll keep you going to the next slide, Lee, and then instantly kept feedback about their uh, about their outcomes. Um, so and then would have a worker sort of sit with them and go through those outcomes with them and, and how they're tracking on their, on their journey. So this was really important that if they were going to collect outcome data, that, that data first and foremost would go back to the clients who were uh, providing that information and it could add a value to their experience as well. So you can see, um, you know, some of the scores there. Um, if we go on to the next, the next slide, just because we, we don't have a huge amount of time, but I'll go on to the next slide. Claire was the therapeutic community program manager and at a six monthly mark, she wanted to see how the program was going against that theory of change. So the next slide sort of shows us um, a traffic light system looking at, this was sort of mock data, um, but how, how we were going against those outcomes for those uh, population group. And we were using a sort of statistical test in the background to see if that was significant change. And so what we were seeing was that we were getting improved sleep and reduced stress uh, in that first two weeks, which was part of that therapeutic journey that they were on. Um, and then, you know, we were seeing some positive change in personal responsibility, which is part of their theory of change again, but it wasn't yet statistically significant. So this was a way of sort of panning out, having this all automated in the background. Um, so at a program level, they could sort of go, what's going on there? Um, so that was how we did that. I just want to very quickly show you a, a little bit behind that curtain. 
uh, so we'll, we'll scroll over. Um, what we did was we started with the theory of change development. We developed the m and &E framework. We then uh, generated the tool. And as I said, we put them into an online form. And then we created a data warehouse. So this is the work that Laura was saying, you know, there's the work that goes on in the background. Um, and then, you know, then the visualization reports were created. So that's the process um, that, you know, I think we, we, we use over and over and over again in our work. So that might be useful for others. You've, you've got to do that work up front around key evaluation questions and what are the outcomes? And then your visualizations need to report on those specifically. Otherwise you'll get lost in the sheer amount of data that is available out there. I think that's the end of my case study. I'll, I'll pass on to- My, uh, my takeaway there to take it back to a comment that Laura made is the magic button is the very final little step in a very, very <laughs> chain of work and effort and thinking and planning. Absolutely, yeah. Mm, that's great. Thanks, Jen. Um, Laura, yeah, I'd love to see something that your team has been working on too. Thanks. I think there were some slides. Yep, great. Um, so um, I chose a couple items to share with you all. Um, largely, um, not quite as impressive as um, Jen's report, um, but largely to help you uh, see how um, we've been able to visualize mass amounts of data um, and to reduce the, um, the time, I suppose, that it was taking us to get there. Um, we have a program called the Chronic Conditions Model of Care. Um, there's about $5 million invested into um, improving um, the health and well-being of people living with chronic conditions in our region. Um, so we have a commitment to understand how that's being um, purposed and used, and um, also in um, looking at how efficient or effective services are. Um, we've got about 11 um, programs that, or 11 um, providers, I should say, that deliver this um, service across the region. And um, they all have slightly different indicators depending on what the priority chronic conditions are in their area. Um, so the long and short of it is that um, we had um, a large sum of money um, attached to this program. We had 11 different providers, each using three different um, spreadsheets um, originally to report to us. And then um, on a uh, monthly basis, we had a staff member who was spending approximately um, a week of their time to analyze what became 33 different spreadsheets um, to provide um, monitoring back to the providers and to the program managers um, so that they could do um, you know, that contract management work as well. And um, by, um, now granted, it took a lot of work to get that data um, cleansed and formatted um, so that we could then um, import it into Power BI and create what's before you. Um, but now, um, this largely happens um, automatically. It does require checking. You do have to, you know, make sure nothing's been broken in the process. And, um, you know, you still want to um, ensure that your data is cleansed appropriately. But um, we've been able to create reports for our providers that um, they can access immediately. So as they're updating their information, largely they can see how they're tracking um, performance wise, um, where they're delivering and our project or program managers can also keep track of that and know if they need to be initiating any um, performance management um, type questions. It then gives us um, a great opportunity to reflect on data and to look at data over time so that um, now as we're looking at um, co-designing a, a potentially new or vari um, variation to the model, um, we've got all of that historical data um, to look back at and it's in a manner that's really easy to consume. That's probably key on that one. And I think there's another slide about um, the um, Commonwealth um, has put in place um, 10 key quality um, improvement measures um, that um, general practices 
uh, are me uh, measured on. And those, each of those measures is on the right hand side. And um, you know, there's a big large definition um, for each of those measures that's provided by um, the AIHW, the Australian Institute of Health um, and Welfare. Um, so we're, we work with them on this project. But um, across our whole region, we have approximately 169 general practices who are um, sharing their um, patient, um, very aggregated, definitely de-identified um, patient um, information with us on these 12 me or 10 measures, sorry. Um, and we're providing back to um, each of those practices um, a report that shows how they're tracking um, compared to um, the national average. So um, what happens is they click in that um, practice name, they find their practice and they only have access to their practice information. Um, they can decide which uh, measure they want to look at in the right hand side, um, click on um, whatever um, the relative or relevant uh, measure is. And in this case, it's um, influenza immunization for patients with COPD, which is a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And they can see how they're tracking um, sorry, I said nationally, it's actually compared to the, the rest of the 169 general practices that are sharing data with us um, across the region. And we um, are, you know, looking at other ways to expand this. It's a fairly um, new piece of work, but, um, you know, trying to think of what information is um, important to the general practices to see, to drive their quality improvement. And so we're working with them to understand what they need to see in these reports. Um, but the nice thing is this does align to um, deliverables they have um, with the Commonwealth to be paid a, a performance incentive payment. And um, it aligns to the measures of the AIHW, which is um, you know, very well respected for their um, health and well-being um, data that they collect. Might be it. That's great. Thanks so much, Laura. Looks like it'd be super handy for those practices to have yeah such great benchmarking data um, as well as their personal data that's fantastic thank you um adrian i'd love to see an example from you great so i'm going to share my screen i'm going to share one of my favorite dashboards great share great um can you see my screen well am i sharing my screen well great thank you so one of my favorite dashboards is the one for the Young Farmers Business Program. So the Young Farmers Business Program is a new uh, South Wales government program that aims to enhance the resilience and business skills of young farmers and fishers in the state by offering um, new business ideas, tools, products, and services. So what's the story behind this dashboard? The Young Farmers Program needed a tool to help communicate the program's achievements in a visual and accessible way to the young farmer, the fisher, and, and all the stakeholders. So uh, at Clear Horizon, we actually developed an end-to-end -end solution, which included a comprehensive uh, mail framework, the data collection tools, and then we moved on to uh, co-design a visually engaging and meaningful dashboard. So on this dashboard, uh, we have clear three, uh, clearly three sections. And on this first part, this dashboard tracks program outputs and provides instant updates around social media and engagement. For example, we have number of events, number of coaching sessions, all the social media activities and the number of farmers and fishers that have been reached. So this is live information that is being fed automatically to this dashboard. So uh, next on the map, we can see the, where the events ha that have taken place are located. And through the size of the bubbles, we can identify where more people have attended. So for instance, immediately I can see a huge bubble here. And if I want to identify, well, specifically they've been uh, a thousand attendees and throughout uh, 11 events. So this is uh, giving the new South Wales government 
a feedback on how the outreach is working and it provides real time updates to the stakeholders. So this dashboard in this last uh, section also gives insight into progress towards long-term outcomes, uh, which are being captured through an online uh, survey that automatically feeds information to the dashboard. So this aims to measure the effects that events have had on the farmers and the fishers, you know, how, how the, the practices, what has happened, uh, thanks to, the, to the, the events. So for instance, we have information, uh, how they respond, how they feel about either connecting with other young farmers, how their business knowledge and skills uh, have developed, and if they've been able to access new skills, uh, products and services. So look, this is one of my favorite dashboards because it's definitely visually engaging. It tells a very clear narrative story the data grouping is absolutely clear uh, and is absolutely it's simple, but it's striking at the same time. And I can see the information that I need at glance immediately. So I mentioned that this dashboard is publicly available on the Young uh, Farmers Business Program Farm Table website. Maybe we can uh, share the link so people can explore it. Definitely, we'll drop that into the chat. I uh, like that combo, striking, visually uh, arresting, and gives you the information you need when you need it. That's great. Thanks, Adriana. Uh, lucky last again. Sorry, Drew, to always leave you to the end. Um, I understand you've got a dashboard you'd like to share too. Yeah, that's right. Now, um, are there some slides? Here we go. Thanks for that, Lee. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to talk about one of our uh, big clients, uh, the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. So this is a... a, a, a very large project. It started in 2018 when the Australian government announced uh, a massive investment in uh, reef protection, not nearly, uh, nearly half a billion dollars, um, which established the Reef Trust Partnership, which brings together uh, different groups of people, including the government, uh, the wider community, uh, reef management um, uh, organizations, traditional owners, and others to work in collaboration to, uh, to benefit the reef. And this partnership comprised of, or comprises of six different components. Uh, one is water quality, which is the largest component, so improving the quality of uh, the, the water in the Great Barrier Reef. Um, Crown of Thorns starfish control, so not all starfish are nice, is something that I learned uh, in this project. And uh, those starfish in particular are very bad for coral, so controlling the population of the Crown of Thorns starfish. Reef rest restoration and, and adaptation science, so investments into uh, restoring the reef and uh, bringing life back into the reef. Traditional owner reef protection and community reef protection, that's involving both traditional owners and the wider community. Um, and then finally, integrated monitoring and reporting. So uh, building systems that tie together all these partners, uh, all these projects in a very uh, seamless way to, um, to communicate progress. Now, if we uh, move down to the next slide, we can give you a bit of context on, on the scale of this project. So just, um, uh, you know, up to this point, we have invested a hundred over a hundred million dollars into the project across three hundred plus partners and one hundred and sixty different projects. So various data sources, various partners, all tying into this one uh, overall um, partnership, which uh, leads us to um, the key question, which we'll find on the next slide. Thanks, Lee. Um, how might the GBRF remain transparent and accountable to both the Australian government and the Australian public, given that this is taxpayer money that has been invested, so that they can demonstrate the value and the impact of their efforts? So similar to, um, uh, you know, the, the Windana um, process that Jen outlined, we started off by developing component-specific outcomes uh, which would be measured through a monitoring and evaluation plan that we built in collaboration with uh, the GBRF. And then we developed a series of interactive dashboards that are publicly available 
to demonstrate and communicate progress on each of these uh, components and each of the outcomes under these components. Now, uh, we don't have a lot of time, but the good news is they are public facing dashboards. So we'll, we'll just move through um, a few of the slides. Thanks, Lee. So this is the first one, the community reef protection dashboard. As you can see in the top left uh, corner, there's a scope section, which uh, allows you to interact with the dashboard. We have um, a geographic component. So there's almost always a, a mapping component in the dashboard, a quick overview right up the top, uh, demonstrating quick facts and figures, and then a more detailed uh, look into the partnerships outcomes. And I've, I've uh, given you a small bit.ly link there that you can follow to see each of these dashboards. So if we move on to the next slide, Lee. Again, you see a very similar uh, format with the, the location-based data, the quick overview, and then more details into the, the outcomes of uh, the, the project. So this is the involvement of traditional owners in reef protection. And the next slide, Lee. Thank you. This is the crown of thorns starfish control. I've included a picture of uh, the naughty starfish there as well. So um, this is, uh, again, very similar format, keeping that consistency, making sure that the, the data comes through nice and uh, in a, in, presented in a simple way, but also allows you to engage and interact with the data to explore these outcomes a bit better. Um, and if we move on to the next slide, we have water quality, the big one. And again, I wanna re-emphasize uh, that this is, if you look at the component overview, we have $100 million invested across 109 partners and 71 projects just on this dashboard alone. So this is tying together data from so many different organizations, so many different projects, and so many different investments in a very nice, clean, and clear, concise dashboard that communicates um, the right facts to the right audiences in the right format. And if we move to the next slide, Lee, this is again, the monitoring reporting uh, dashboard. And uh, this one, I'll, I think I will just move on to the final slide, uh, Lee, which is the portfolio dashboards. This is actually a dashboard of dashboards. So it, it brings together um, all of the different components and gives you a very quick overview of the entire partnership. So um, yeah, these are, this is one of the, the um, nicest dashboards I've ever worked on. Um, and uh, I love that it communicates such a, a vast range of projects and partnerships and investments in a very clear, concise um, and interactive way. Thanks, That's Ian. so great, Drew. I've heard so much about um, this work and it's the first time I've actually seen the output and it's beautiful. Um, and so crystal clear as well. Awesome work. Thank you. Great. So um, we've now got about 15 minutes for questions. We've got a couple down the bottom uh, in the Q&A area that I want to open up to first. Um, so the, the question up that's been most upvoted, I believe, is from Michelle. Uh, how are the Power BI reports shared and kept up to date across all the different sites and users? And I, I believe that was intended for Laura. But yeah, general question for everyone too. Sure. Yeah. What I'm finding um, from our perspective is that um, the way that we, oh, Adriana will kill me because I won't get the language right. But the, the way that we're able to um, bring the data in um, these days is very automated. Um, so, um, you know, creating that um, pipeline um, for the data to be brought into um, our data warehouse. And then the way we um, share it out um, means that there are there isn't a lot of need um, to update um, the, um, the reports because it's fully automated. And um, once you have access to the report, um, every time you click in it, you're getting the most current and up-to-date um, data. We do have to be a bit more mindful about um, who we provide internally, what level access um, to the reports and to the data, because as you know, um, there's a lot of, you know, good data governance rules. Um, but um, I think I answered that question. Thanks, Laura. Anything anyone else wanted to chip in there? I'll take that as a no. Okay, great. Um, 
So do you think it's possible to do the same thing you did with the dashboards, but this time with donor reports? So in a way, creating a process and system whereby donor reports can be easily written. I'm happy to take that one. Um, I was just writing a, a note on here that I think hopefully this answers the question. We, we worked with a family violence outfit that was running a JIRA that was running Koori Women's Place. And so what we did was every time someone signed into the service um, on a, on a an iPad using an MS form, so that's Microsoft's uh, forms, and they just sort of said, you know, where they were from, what service they were after, uh, how they heard about the service, the sorts of questions that were both useful for the service, but also ticked off the requirements, the output reporting requirements of Department of Justice. So what they did is that automated and it went straight into a dashboard. And because dashboards can have a time slicer, so we, you know, it, they were quarterly reports that they had to do for Department of Justice, is every quarter, they literally, you can export uh, to a PowerPoint, your dashboards. They exported that screenshot to a PowerPoint and flicked it off to their, to their uh, funder. Um, and in some cases, you know, they were able to actually share the URL and say, help yourself, you know, here's your report. You go look at it every quarter. Um, so that stopped them running around every quarter trying to work out how many people come in, what they'd come in for, you know, um, trying to, you know, come up with the numbers and the figures. So that was that was really great. And I think, you know, that was a good example of, of making their lives easier so they could get on with their jobs. Does that answer that question? Is that about donor reports? Sounds answered to me, but anyone else want to add in anything there? Okay. Uh, we did have a couple of other questions that came through the Q&A and Jen was very efficient and jumped in there and answered them um, by typing some responses. So if you, your question hasn't been answered live, just check that it, it will have been answered. You open the Q&A box and click on the answered box and you'll see it in there. We've got another question that's just come through from anonymous attendee. Uh, is there any Mel databases that you found work well or not so well with Power BI? mean by mail i'm curious about what we mean by mail database like a mail uh, uh system like a management information system or um mm. a data set curious perhaps if the anonymous attendee if you could drop your uh quite a bit more information to the chat and, um in the meantime we'll move on to another question um what technologies have you discovered lately that you found really really useful for this work mm -hmm. Drew or Adriana or Laura want to answer that. Um, I think personally, I, I use MS Forms a lot because I can create a survey that's held in Australia, held on my tenancy, the Office 365 tenancy. It doesn't bounce off to Survey Monkey in Canada and God knows where else. Um, we have used another one that's little that is, gives a bit more of a sophisticated survey tech, which is called Checkbox because we're able to hold that data in Australia and there's a nice link, uh, a nice API um, or an export function into dashboards. But MS Forms, because it goes straight into your Excel, into your SharePoint, and then it can talk straight to your dashboard, it's just always been a favourite. Like I've tried to keep it fairly, fairly simple. Um, in terms of impact data, so population level outcomes, we, you know, we can link it to the ABS data set. There's ways that you can, as an API, where you can link data direct to your APS. Um, a, um, is, um, the ABS, sorry. Um, and we also partner with SIA Data. Um, they have a number, of, they've ingested a number of very large data sets and we're working to inject, to bring that data into Power BI. So for instance, with Go Goldfields, we use, um, that dashboard, which is publicly available as well, that is piped through SEER and SEER has ingested um, a lot of uh, family violence data, uh, educational data and the ACEs data that's available. Anything that's publicly available is being ingested into SEER and that's um, that's available and that, that's been connecting nicely with Power BI. Um, I don't know if my colleagues have got anything else they want to add there. Um, sorry, go on, Adriana. <laughs> All of us. Yeah, adding to, to Jen's comment is it, we definitely like using my, uh, tools that are included within the Microsoft suite. 
because they definitely, I mean, they're from the same family and they play really nicely together. Um, I've become a real fan of Microsoft lists. Uh, Microsoft have a, has it put a lot of investment and development into the list and they become really good. They're really useful. It's like a step up of Excel. It's like a Excel a revamped, a lot better online. And it's a mixture between kind of Excel and Microsoft Forms as well. And it connects really nicely to Power BI. So yeah, I wanted to talk about Microsoft lists. Thanks Adriana, over to you Drew. Um, thanks, Adriana. Yeah, Microsoft List has been uh, making quite a, quite a lot of buzz um, at Clear Horizon lately. Um, one tool that I wanted to talk about is uh, more from a project management perspective. We've been trying to introduce um, Kanban boards and and agile based sprints as ways of working to um, address some of the issues that were brought up. Say, for instance, Laura mentioned. You know, there's this huge process that happens before these dashboards go live. And it's a very often an invisible process, at, you know, with gens behind the curtains, you know. Um, and what we're trying to do with this Kanban board is increase visibility and uh, clarity around all of the work that goes on behind the scenes with mm -hmm. building a dashboard and involving people in that process, especially important on projects like say GBRF, where there are multiple components and people aren't necessarily aware of requests coming through from these different components. So they might send through a request uh, for work required on a dashboard, but be unaware of requests that have come from a different component. So by building something like a Kanban board, uh, which is uh, an agile um, uh, project management tool, I definitely look it up, it's very useful. Um, it, it introduces clarity and, um, and transparency to the process. Mm. And there's lots of tools you can use um, to manage a Kanban board. You can use Absolutely. Planner, which is built into um, the Microsoft environment. So mm -hmm. yeah, lots of options. Thanks, Drew. Uh, we got a bit of clarity there from uh, the previous question. Uh, so Michelle says, thinking of examples like Social Suite, Penelope, ETO, Data Solutions. So I think by Mel databases, she's asking Mel oh, yeah. data sets really. Um, so yeah, any particular data sets or data sources you found have worked really well with Power BI or not so well? Um, we might look anything that can extract to the moment it's in a digital format, it, the world changes for you. So you can get it into any digital format, be it a social suite or a Penelope or an efforts to outcomes or any of those. Most of them will let you extract. Some of them have a, their own visualizations built in. Like I know Social Suite have a visualization uh, dashboard that you built into that. Um, and, and a lot of them will start adding that on. But you can extract that. Like I've been using um, Salesforce data, which is a CRM data uh, with, a, with a service. And that extracts really, because there's a connection. So with Power BI, there are over 200 connections into um, Salesforce or SharePoint or SurveyMonkey or, I don't know, the web, you know, all sorts of things. So um, we, we don't use any of those proprietary systems. Um, we use our own in that we, we just sort of go, we keep it really simple and we go, These are, this is your mail framework, which is currently in a word, but we're about to put this into an online tool. Um, but once it's in that format, we create the tools, which are normally Microsoft Forms, and then that extracts straight into the Power BI. Um, so they... They do work well with Power BI because they they if they export to CSV, you know, comma separated value, ex, you know, sort of uh, spreadsheets into a SharePoint, then they'll talk nicely to Power BI. Um, it just it just depends how what that extraction's like, how fast it can extract, um, and how you can set up those automations with those particular products. Um, but you need to sort of probably find out a little bit more about them. Um, but I think for me, it's getting it into that digital format. So whatever tool you use is thumbs up, you know, really in a way. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jen. I think that covers it. Uh, last question. Um, I think we've largely covered how compatible is the system with other platforms like Smartsheets. And as, you, as you're saying, there's lots of connections, lots of ways of doing it. If it's not available out of the box, you could use a developer to connect with an API or, or there's, there's ways you can work 
around um, not having an out-of-the-box integration, right? And you know, Power BI is only one of the visualization tools out there. There is Tableau and there is Yellowfin. There are others. Um, I think the questions to ask is how easy is it to use? What's the cost of it? Where's the data hosted? So if those are the three sorts of things when you're making a judgment is ease of use, you know, there might be no upfront cost, but are you going to get paid a lot later over the life of it? Um, you know, it, it, where is that data being held? Is it being held in Australia if you're an Australian provider? And um, the cost, I think that was the other piece I said, the cost there. So things to consider. Um, we went with Power BI because it's part of the Microsoft suite um, and they've spent like billions on it. They've, they're, and every month a new upgrade comes out. There's a whole community around it. But, um, you know, that's just been the direction we go in. Thank you, Jen. And thank you to all our panellists uh, who joined me today on today's webinar. Especially grateful to you, Laura, um, for taking you know an hour out of your workday to come share your experiences with Power BI. It's been so great to see uh, you and your team's journey uh, since doing the course through to those amazing dashboards. So thank you and, and well done. Um, also, would really love to uh, thank all of our uh, attendees who came along today. Uh, we will be sending out a recording of this video. Feel free to share that with any, whoever you think might be interested in the topic. We also have a course running uh, commencing in a week's time on this very topic. So using data, visualization and reporting uh, to drive uh, positive impact. So look out for that. There will be a special discount winging your way via email, um, as well as a link to, to jump on in there and register your place. So have a great day and enjoy the weekend when you get there. All the best. Thanks, Kevin.